Hey there, so today we're starting our uh, review of exponentials and logs, which will run for the next few days or next few videos. Um, and so <clears throat> I thought we could start uh, with first uh, writing down some basics that we know. Okay, so we know uh, A equals P E to the RT, where this is our ending amount, this is our starting amount, this is our rate, and this is time. And we use this for continuous growth. But we could have variations of that, like if instead of uh, talking about amounts and principles, uh, we could talk about quantities, initial quantities, a rate of change, and time. And, you know, maybe we're talking about population. And so we've got P sub O, E to the KT. All of these are synonyms. Now, we also have the ones you started learning in um, Algebra 2, P1 plus R to the T. This is annual growth. And I guess if we put a minus here, that would be annual decay, or more often we see the word depreciation, a lowering of value. We could have our compounded interest formula, P1 plus R over N to the NT, where N is the number of compoundings per year. So if we're talking about compounding the interest monthly, n is going to be 12, and I have to put a 12 here and a 12 here. And then finally, um, there's this formula that I actually use quite a bit when I'm asked to write the equation, those going backwards problems. When I'm asked to write the equation of an exponential, I usually reach for this instead of this. You can use this. It's just that the algebra is a little more, and I definitely need a calculator. Um, and this usually works out nice and straightforward. Um, so, given two points on a graph. This would be my preference. Okay, so those are all our basics. Now, what about... How do I know whether a model represents both or decay. Well, if I have um, a equals 10 e to the negative 0.2t, because this rate is between 1 and 0, I know that I'm looking at decay. Likewise, if I had a equals 10 e to the positive 0.2t, then I would know that, oh, silly me, let's try that again. Because this is negative, because r is less than 0, I know I have decay. Phew -wee. All right, and here, because r is greater than 0, we have growth. All right. Now, can we say anything about, um, about this form, y equals a times b to the x? How will I know using this form if I have growth or decay? So in this situation, when b is between 1 and 0, then I have decay. But if b is bigger than 1, then I have growth. So what happens if we put those two concepts together? Okay, here we're just looking at the sign on the rate to determine growth or decay. And here we're looking at how big the base is. And if the base is between 0 and 1, I have decay. Okay, so let's put those together and let's talk about this one. y equals 10 to to the negative point 4t. 
because my base is greater than one, I know I'm looking at growth until I see, oh, that's decay. And it may be helpful for you to think about I'm multiplying a positive times a negative to get a negative. If we wrote this one though, that's going to be, and you know why I said negative and a positive to a negative? Because I was thinking about 2 to the 1 power. And when I raise a power to a power, I multiply it. Well, here I could think of this as 10 times 2 to the negative 1 the negative 0.42. When I raise a power to a power and multiply, negative times negative is positive. And so now I'm looking at growth. Okay. And of course, if I have 10 1 half to the positive 0.42, this is growth, this is decay, or 2 to the negative 1 raised to the 0.4, I'm going to get 2 to the negative 0.4, and so I know that this is decay, okay? So, what else? Well, we know some exponential rules, like a to the x times a to the y. When the bases are the same and I'm multiplying, what can I do to simplify this expression? That's right, I can add the exponents. Just like if I see adding exponents, I could actually go this way. And we'll be doing that next semester. All right, what else do we know? We know that this, when I have these two exponentials with the same base and I'm dividing, then I can say, well, that's a to the x minus y. Many students are reluctant to use this one, but I like subtracting the exponents. So you might think about it as well. All right, don't forget <clears throat> when I raise a power, to a power, like we said a few moments ago, that I multiply those exponents. Um, and then if I have a, b to the x, I can apply that power to each of these, a to the x, b to the x. Likewise, if I see this, I can pull that x out and put it to the expression of a times b. Don't confuse this one with this one. Yeah, I can't do anything here. Like, if these are twos, no problem. I've got a squared times b squared. But here, if I have a two, well, that's a plus b times a plus b. And it's definitely not a squared plus b squared. That's sad face. Instead, it turns out to be a squared plus 2ab plus b squared when I FOIL it out. Okay, so whenever I see a plus or a minus here, I can't, can't just distribute the power. Okay. I can only distribute the power here with multiplication or also a over b to the x, a to the x over b to the x. I can apply that power outside only in the cases of multiplication or division. Otherwise, I'm looking at something that's foiling. So watch out for that, please. Okay, how about a to the negative x. Well, hopefully by now we know that's 1 over a to the x. Likewise, if I see 1 over a to the negative x, then that's going to be a to the positive x over 1. We flip those negatives into positives as we move them from wherever they were to wherever they weren't. Okay, and uh, I guess the last basic that we're supposed to know uh, a to the zero. Well, in the past, we used to say the words anything to the zero power is one, and that's not actually true. Sorry. So 
0 to the 0 power is an indeterminate form. An indeterminate form is something that depends on a given situation to figure out the value of. Sometimes this will be 0, sometimes this will be 1, sometimes this will be infinity, sometimes this will be 2 thirds, sometimes this will be negative 7. Uh-oh. So because 0 to the 0 isn't always 0, um, we have to change that thing that we used to say where anything to the 0 power is 1 to be now almost anything to the 0 power is 1. The only thing that's not is 0 to the 0. Okay. So we're going to say a can't equal 0. That's best. If we have this, a to the 0, but a can't be equal to 0, then yes, that's 1. But without this little thing, then, well, that's not always true. Okay? All right, so let's move on to thinking about some basic word problems. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, go back and revisit our COVID-19 infection data uh, that we saw a few videos ago on 525, which I'm going to call t equals 0. 222 people got infected on that day. And on 527, which is t equals 2, we had 479 people who reported testing positive on that day. <clears throat> 529, t equals 4, because remember we're counting days since the 25th. There were 702 people infected. And on 62, which is t equals 8, we had 1127. And I believe I still have this data in my calculator. Let's turn on the light. I did turn on the light. There it is. Um, and let's see about uh, stat edit. Yes, I have all this data here. I even have an extra point, which is 6, 7, t equals 13. 1438. Okay, so I remember when we did our linear regression, uh, second no, stat count linear regression, L1 comma L2 comma Y1, that we came up with something like this, 93.739 plus, oh, x plus 287.410. Oh. And I remember plugging a 13 into this equation by using the table. I plug in a 13. I get 1506. Oh, that's actually higher. So this model didn't work for us. Huh, I wonder if I plug in 4. Ah. This number is much higher. Our value is 66237. And so maybe this, I mean, I, I think we determined that it was close to linear, but maybe an exponential model would be better. As is often the case with, um, as is often the case with uh, functions, you know, if that linear model isn't working, maybe it's an exponential model. So let's do an exponential regression. Okay, calculate, keep going, quadratic, ln, exponential regression. And I still want to use list one, list two, and variables, y variables, function y variables, y y. Actually, let's put this in y two. Why, you might ask? Well, because I already have the linear regression, and then we could take a look and see if we liked one better than the other. And enter. 
Okay, so look, they're using y equals a times b to the x, and we get the formula 320.5963081 times 1.14160387 to the x. There's our exponential model. Um, and um, let's see what happens when uh, we graph it along with our uh, scatter plot data. In fact, let's remind ourselves what we thought of the linear model. So remember zoom number nine is zoom stat. So zoom stat. And we thought that was a pretty good line of best fit. But if I now turn that one off and graph this one, the exponential model, come on. Graph. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of like the linear one more, don't I? Um, okay. So maybe linear, uh, linear model is better here, but I'd still like to um, ask the questions um, that we would ask after building an exponential model like this, like when will infection, daily infections, daily infections, be 4,500 people that day. It's a lot of people testing positive. Okay, so is this an input or an output? Well, we know in this model, we're plugging in times and we're getting out a number of people infected uh, that on that day. So does this go in for x or does this go in for y? When will there be daily infections of 4,500? So this is an output. So I'm gonna have my exponential model equal to 4,500. And what I'm gonna to need to do then is graph the exponential function and graph the horizontal line and do second calculate intersect. So let's come down here and type in 4,500 and graph. Now, we talked about this before. Why don't I see that horizontal line at 4,500 like I expect? And the answer is because my viewing window stops here. Where is that that it's stopping? 1,600. So there's no way I'm going to see 4,500. So why don't I change this to go from 0 to 6,000 in steps of 500. I wonder if I'm going to have to change the days. In fact, I know I'm going to have to change the days because 13 was the end of the graph. And now I want to go much higher than that. So let's try 30 here and see what happens. There's my exponential model. Doesn't look so bad when I look at it out here. And there's a point of intersection. Second, calculate, intersect. First curve, yes. Second curve, yes. Guess, go ahead. And we get t equals 19.946 days after 525. So we know there were 31 days in May. So that takes six of these off. And so then we're going to be left with 613. Uh, sometime on 613, June 13, we uh, supposedly reached our maximum. You know, I kind of want to look it up and see uh, if I can find what the daily infection rates were for uh, that day uh, in Pima County. This is only Pima County we're looking for. And 613, nope, 
Now, on 613, the actual number it was 1540. Uh, and that's much smaller than 4,500. We did get to 4,500. Uh, we actually got to 4,877 on July 4th, uh, 1st. And so 630, we had 4,682. So we're kind of way off when we're using this exponential model here. It didn't look so bad on this graph. But if we now go back and graph that linear model at the same time, the linear one is definitely looking like it's closer to all of the points. And our when, according to our linear model, will we hit uh, an intersection with 4,500? In fact, I'm going to try 4,682 now. 4,682. Um, I have to make my x's go bigger, so let's try 50, not 500. 50 in steps of 5. All right, so we know this is going to be in the middle of June, and we weren't at that rate uh, of increase by the middle of June. But let's see where that is. Second, calculate, intersect. Now I have to be careful because I have three equations. Yes, this is my first equation. Um, no, I don't think this is my second equation. That's the exponential model. I'm not trying to figure out where the exponential and the linear meet. I'm trying to find out where the exponential and the constant meet. So I have to cycle through my options using the up arrow until I find that constant function. And where? 46.88, 46.881. So 46 days. Well, we know that there were six days left in May, and then that gives us 40 days. And we know that June has 30, so this would be July 10th. And I think July 10th is uh, closer than June 13th. Well, maybe it's just splitting the difference, and our infection rate is between those. Okay, luckily, um, more recently, we, uh, we reached our uh, another local max at 4,000 on July 9th. No, 4,200 on July 10th. But when we got to the 13th, the number of infections reported that day in Pima County had dropped to 1,357. Okay, so maybe things are getting better. Maybe people are starting to spread less quickly this virus because they're taking masks seriously. Um, okay, so what do I want to do now? I want to do some more word problems. Uh, I think it would be good if we uh, dug into half-life problems. Remember, Half-life is a time. It's a time. When we talk about half-life, we're talking about a time. It's the time it takes for us to have half of the original Okay. Now, remember also, we had a shortcut for finding the rate in half-life problems. We said that, sure, we'll use Q equals Q sub O e to the kt. And in a half-life problem, that k is going to be ln of a half over the time for half-life, okay? I mean, you can derive it if you want, but let's try. Okay, so I know that, uh, uh, where's my half-life problem? 
not showing my game first. Um, okay. So, um, we know that the half-life of carbon-14, 57, 30 years. And let's say we start off uh, with one gram of carbon-14. And I want to know, uh, I want to build a half-life model. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think about um, this as an ordered pair of time and amount. So at time equal to zero, I have one gram. Okay. If I use Q equals Q sub O E to the KT, and I plug this in, a zero here for T and a one here, Zero times k is zero, e to the zero is one, one times q sub o is q sub o. And so I know that q sub o equals one. Great. So now I can go back here and put in a one. But I still don't have a model, right? Because I still got this extra variable, one, two, three variables. I want quantity as a function of time, and that means these are the only two variables I should have. So, what do I need to do then? Well, I need to use this piece of information. Now, half-life means that the quantity equals half of the original amount. So, I could do this problem one of two ways. I could say, okay, I know the original amount is one, and so at this time, 5730, I'll have Okay. So let's plug that second order pair in. One half equals one e to the k fifty-seven three. Now I divide both sides by one. One half equals e to the k fifty-seven three. And how do I solve this? What is it that I need to do next? That's right. I need to take the ln of both sides. So I can bring this down with the log power rule. And what am I going to end up with? Well, coming very shortly, we'll see ln of a half equals 5730k. And if I'm solving for k, I'm going to divide both sides by 5730. Now, you may remember that I said a moment ago, we yeah, have the, short, uh, the shortcut for finding the k in half life. K equal to ln of a half over 5730. And, you know, in a pre-cal class or Algebra 2 class, we want students to show that work. Um, but, you know, you've already done that. So why don't you just use the K is ln of a half over time for half life. You know, we could do variations on this if we say wanted to double the amount of money. So our doubling rate looks like this, ln of 2 over time to double. And if we were talking about tripling, because sometimes populations triple, then we would have k equals ln of 3, because we're tripling over time to triple. So those are... Uh, those are shortcuts that we can use when we go through these problems. So let's go back to our original quantity and say, all right, we've got Q equals 1 times E to the ln of a half over 57.30 T. There's our exponential uh, decay model for the carbon uh, 14 that, uh, that an object has. So now we can use this model to predict some things. When will there be point 0.1 lapse? And the second question is, um, how much remains after Okay, so let's
let's try answering these two questions. Remember, our input on this function is time, and our output on this function is quantity in grams. So when will there be 0.1 grams? Well, that's grams. That's not time. So it doesn't go here, it goes here. So we've got 0.1 equals e to the L and the half over 57.30t. So how do I solve this equation? Well, I could certainly take out my graphing calculator and graph this in y1 and this in y2 and do second calculating yourself. However, half the AP exam is without calculator. So let's do it by hand. Now I'm going to take this whole power down in front. Ln of 0.1 equals ln of a half over 57.30t. And I'm trying to solve this equation for t. So I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal 57.30 over ln of a half. 57.30 over ln of a half. Hey, do you remember? Oh, so this is the ln of 0.1. Okay. So on my calculator, I can do 57.30, oops, not here, 57.30 ln 0.1, those parentheses is really important there, divided by ln of 1. And I get that it's going to take 19,034.648 years. Okay, hey, how much will remain after 20,000 years? Well, I bet a little less than 0.1 grams. Well, let's figure this out. How do I do this? This now is a time, it's an input. And so I'm thinking about e to the L and a half over 5730 times 20,000 years. All of this is in the exponent, and this is a number, so I'm going to get a quantity when I do this. So I've got 20,000. And more than that, really. I've got 20,000 times L and a half divided by 57. And then I end up with a negative number because instead of 57.30, I was supposed to do the L and a half. Right. And that's supposed to be 20,000. Oh my goodness. Second answer is zero. And here we want ln of 1. No, that's on top. Oh, gosh, where does add to that? Let's go back and change this to a point 1. So what is it going to be? Look, look, not my job. Some days are stupider than others. This is the problem I'm doing, not that one. This is what I need. I need 20,000 times ln of a half divided by 57.30. And remember, this is the exponent that we're looking at here. And if this is the exponent that we're looking at here, then I need still to do e raised to that power. And I get 0.089 grams. OK. So um, what I'd like to do is a couple more of these uh, problems. Uh, it's actually a worksheet that I want you to be working on. It's called exponential word problems. Uh, but let's uh, let's go through some of these. Okay. In uh, Tianjin, it's a city in China. Tianjin had a population of 10.24 million. That's right. More people than live in Arizona lived in this one city in 2004. And in, there were 12.28 million in 2009. I mean, really, this is big. Uh, and so, oh, thank you. Okay, I want to make sure you can see the problems as we do the problems. Um, and what I'd like to do now is uh, figure out the population of Tianjin today. Okay, 
So if we take a population model, and I'm of a mind that, oh, you know, that's interesting. Let's talk about this. Should I use this versus this? Annual growth versus continuous growth. You know, I can see you making an argument for either one of these. Because while women are continuously giving birth, and so a continuous function makes sense there, we're probably only counting the people, we're probably only counting the people once a year. So I think I would accept either of these models, uh, unless the problem explicitly uh, states uh, continuous or not. I'm going to go with continuous model here, and I'm going to think about these as ordered pairs. Let's say that 2004 is t equals 0, and then we can say 0, 10.24, and this is five years after that, so t equals 0 is 2004, this would be 5, 12.28. Okay. So how can we build this model? Well, if we're doing really well, and we're really comfortable with this, um, then we'll know that this is our initial amount. Um, but um, uh, some people don't recognize that, um, in which case we have to actually plug this value up. So I'm going to plug this in for t and this in for p. Um, so t's and p's. And so I've got 10.24 equals e to the, oops, p sub o, e to the r times 0. Well, 0 times r is 0, and e to the 0 is 1, and 1 times p sub o is p sub o. But if I just know that this, when I see a 0 input, that's the initial amount, and that's the initial amount. So, I don't have to actually show that step. I can jump right to 10.24 e to the r t. And now let's plug in this second order pair. 12.28 equals 10.24 e to the r times 5. And I want to solve for this rate. Okay? I have to build this population model, which meant I needed to find the initial amount and the rate. Okay, so I'm going to divide both sides by 10.24. And that's going to give me 12.28 equals e to the 5r. Remember, I'm trying to solve for r, so I've got to get this power down. I'm going to take the ln of both sides. And then I can use the power rule to bring this down in fact. So, over here now, the ln of 12.28 over 10.4 equals 5r ln of e. What's the ln of e equal to? 1. So this is 5r equals the ln of 12.28 over 10.24. Great, let's divide by 5 to get r by itself. So now, I've got, on my calculator, ln of 12.28 divided by 10.24, close those parentheses, divided by 5. And so my rate turns out to be 0.036330606. Please don't round that rate. You and I will get very different answers if you round that rate. Don't round in the middle of the problem. You only round at the end of the problem. Okay, so building my continuous growth model then looks like this. Population equals 10.24 e to the 0 0.036334060606 t. All right, there's our population model. Now remember what we wanted to do Let's figure out what is the population of Tianjin in 2020. Okay, so how many years after 2004 is that? That's t equals 16. And so if I have a choice of plugging in a p or a t, and this stands for population, and this stands for time, I'm going to plug the 16 in up here. And again, I, okay, 
So I'm going to take that rate and I'm going to multiply that rate by 16. That's going to be my exponential power, so I want e raised to that power. And don't forget, I need to multiply by the initial amount, 10.24. And so I get the population in 2020 would be 18.314 million, larger than New York or Los Angeles. All right, well, let's see if we can look up on the internet what the uh, what the population of Tianjin is today. Okay, population of Tianjin in 2020. Okay, happy internet. What do you have for me today? Oh. 13.589 million. So we experienced a 2 million increase, um, or something like 18% increase here in these five years. But in the 11 years after that, we haven't even gone up 2 million again. So this is not, the population is increasing, and it did look like it was increasing exponentially here, faster and faster. But what we see is actually the population started to shrink. Uh, not shrink, but grow at a slower rate. Okay? All right. How about we look at Detroit? Meanwhile, in Detroit, in 1990, there were 1 million people living in Detroit. And by 2009, Detroit was down to, I'm sorry, 2011. Detroit was down to 700,000. Um, yeah, it lost uh, a third of its population in 21 years. That's really scary. Detroit's like the size of Tucson now. Okay, so let's build a model here and find out when they'll have Tucson's population. So first we'll build the model, then we'll use the model, okay? All right, so I'm gonna call this t equals zero, and so this is t equals 21. And hopefully I know when I see t equals zero that this is my initial amount. So p equals p sub o e to the r t. I know that my initial amount is one million. Now I'm going to plug in a 21 and a 700,000. Oh, by the way, this was 1 million. So this has to be 0.7 million. And because that's hard for a lot of people to think about, I'm going to actually write the million equals P. So now I plug in my population and I plug in my time. E to the R times 21. If I divide both sides by a million, I get 0.7. And now how do I solve for R? Well, this is where I need to bring that exponent down, so I have to have a log present. And so I'm going to have the ln of 0.7 equals 21R ln of E. We know the ln of E is 1. 1 times R is just R. So we get r by itself, I still need to divide by 21. So then I can build my model as ln of 0.7 over 21t. That's going to be my population model for Tianjin. I'm sorry, for Detroit. Now, we want to know when it will have the population of Tucson. Well, let's look up the population of Tucson in 2020. Okay, Magic Internet, you tell me that the population is 553871. Okay, and we seem to be the 33rd largest city in the United States. All right, so uh, uh, this is the population of Tucson. I want to know when Detroit will get to that population. So I'm going to plug in that population over here, 871 equals 1 million 
e to the ln of 0.7 over 21t. So I need to divide by this, which is going to give me 0 0.553871 equals e to the ln of 0 0.7 over 21t. Remember, I'm trying to solve for t. I need to get t down from the exponent, so I have to take the ln of both sides. So the ln of 0.553871 equals ln of 0.7 over 21t. And now all I have to do is multiply by the reciprocal of this fraction. to find out my t value. So we've got 21 times ln of 0.553871 and divide by the ln of 0.7. And I end up with 34.786 years after 1990. Well, that's going to be 2024. That's not far from now. I wonder if we can uh, we can find the population of Detroit today and see if they're still shrinking. Oh, and the internet says um, huh that's very interesting. Oh here we go. Come on, slow internet. Huh. Well, this site seems to say that their population was huh, uh, was not a million in 1990, but three million. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. Because the other data I looked up said one million. Okay, what was the population in 1990? That's what I'm looking for. 1990. One million. And the population is going down. Oh, here's that data. Okay, and so in 2018, 2018, they had 672,000 people. So it did continue to drop, but look what happened from 2011 to 2018, seven years, to go only 28,000 people. So it started decreasing at a slower rate. So I guess it's going to take a while for Detroit to actually get to our size, but maybe we'll meet in the middle somewhere. Okay, um, let's do a money problem, and then maybe a percent problem, and then call it a day. So... Let's say that uh, you have $100 invested at 2% compounded quarterly. How long until you have Five thousand dollars. Okay, so we're starting off with a hundred dollars. We're investing at two percent compounded quarterly, and we want to know time. So I'm going to use this model, where a equals p one plus r over n to the n t. This is my one hundred. This is my 0 0.02, and these, because we're compounding quarterly, are going to be four. So we've got one hundred. 1 plus 0 0.02 over 4 raised to the 4t. All right? So now I need to solve this equation uh, for time when the amount is 5,000. Uh, 0 0.02 divided by 4 is 0 0.005 raised to the 4t. All right, I'm solving this for time, so I'm going to start by dividing by 100, and then I get to 
50 equals 1.005 to the 4t. Now, I need to get that t down from the exponent, so I'm going to have to take the ln of both sides to bring this power down. But unlike in the other problems we've done today, this doesn't go away. This isn't the ln of e, so that doesn't go away. And I'm trying to solve for t. Well, how are these things attached to t? That's attached with multiplication. That's attached with multiplication. So if I want to get t by itself, I have to divide by the 4 and the ln of 1.005. 4 ln 1.005. Make sure when you're doing this on your calculator that you put all of that in parentheses. Okay? So I've got the ln of 50 divided by parentheses 4 times the ln of 1.005 and close the second parenthesis, and I get it's going to take, you remember time here is in years, it's going, do you have a guess? Do you think? T equals 196.090 years. Sorry, here, this is not going to be a get-rich-quick scheme if you start off at 100 and invest it at 2%. Um, yeah, you need uh, to start off with more money uh, and maybe find a higher percent. Okay, and how about this one? Um, how old is the money if it has 49% of its carbon-14 remaining? Okay, now I have to bring two things to this problem. The first is I need to know the half-life of carbon-14, which is approximately 5730. Actually, it actually ranges between 5730 and 5750, and our pre-cal textbook used 5730. I believe our calculus textbook uses 5700. I'm just going to keep using the 5730. Okay. All right, that's one thing I need to bring to this. The other thing is a definition of percent. Okay, this is not a rate percent. This is percent of the original amount. So let's talk about percent. If you take a test and it has 100 points and you get 85 of those points, we say you have an 85%. We took the original number of points and we divided that into what you had. And that method of dividing what you had by the original amount can help us if we say got a 61 out of 70. When we divide 61 by 70, or when we divide what you had by the original amount, we get percent. And so if we bring that into um, our model, q equals q sub o kt, we know this is the original amount, and we know this is what you have after t years. So if I divide both sides by q sub o, this is what you had divided by original amount. And what you had divided by original amount is percent. So when we divide both sides by q sub o to get q divided by q sub o, that's our definition of percent. Okay, so what percent? In our problem, we have a 49% or 0.49. And we know the k because we know our half-life shortcut. So let's take a look at this. We're going to have q, no, we're going to have point, no, let's write it out, q over q sub o equals e to the ln of a half over 5730t. And now I'm saying that q over q sub o is percent. So percent equals e to the ln of a half over 5730t. And what was our percent in this problem? 49%, so 0.49 goes here. Now I need to solve this equation for t. So I'm going to take the ln of both sides. Bring down this power, and that will give me 
the ln of 0.49 equals the ln of a half over 5730 t ln of e. Ah, in this problem we have an ln of e, and so we know that this is 1, so that's going to go away. But now I'm trying to solve for t, so I'll multiply by the reciprocal 5730 over ln of a half, 5730 over ln of a half. All right, so that turns out to be 5730 ln of 0.49 divided by ln of 0.5. And I get 5,897.009 years old. When this mummy is almost 6,000 years old, we've got... Um, 49% of the carbon remaining. Hey, and you know, remember, we should be writing sentences. So let's write that sentence. 49% um, of the carbon-14 remains after 5897.009 years. Um, you know, always give that three decimal place answer. If you then want to say, or approximately 5897 years. That's okay, but only after you've given the three decimal place answer, okay? All right, hey, how about we get in one more here. Let's write the equation of this line. 0, 4, and 228, and y mm, equals a times b to the x. And we'll make this our last problem for today. Okay, so again, it would be nice if you noticed this was the initial amount. It goes in for a, but if not, 4 equals a times b to the 0. b to the 0, well, we can't have a, a base that is 1 or 0 or negative. So we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to say that's 1 times a, and I get that a equals 4. So y equals 4 times b to the x. And now I'm ready to plug in this other ordered pair. 28 goes here, 4 times b to the second. I divide both sides by 4, I get 7 equals b to the second. Now, do I take the ln of both sides here? No. This is b squared. If I want b, I have to take the square root of each side. So my b value turns out to be the square root of 7. So then our model will be y equals 4 root 7 to the x. Okay? All right. But again, you could use PERT for this if you prefer. We have a homework assignment that goes with this. It is assignment number 12. It's book work. And you'll be able to find this um, in our Office 365 Chapter 1 folder. Let me know if you're having difficulty finding it because this will be, oh, I don't know, fifth or sixth assignment you needed to get from there. All right. I hope you have a great day, everyone. Take care. Oh, don't forget to let me know on group me uh, if you have any questions or bring them up in our live Zooms. Take care.